Good afternoon. I am glad to be here with you today and share some information about significant and fascinating topic – diseases of blood vessels, cardiovascular diseases. So, my name is Korik Valery Ruslanovna and I am Associate Professor of the Department of Pathological Anatomy and Forensic Medicine, Dnipropetrovsk Medical Academy. To start with, I'd like to recommend you to subscribe our YouTube channel. This way you are going to be aware about all new lectures and other useful videos. Next point. The next point is obligatory. Please register in our uh, live chat so we can see who join us and mark your attendance. Also, uh, feel free to write questions because discussion is the best way to get into the particular point. So, let's go. Ischemic heart disease. Since cardiac myocytes generate energy almost exclusively through mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, Cardiac function is strictly dependent upon the continuous flow of oxygenated blood through the coronary arteries. Ischemic heart disease, so uh, this exactly problem, represents a, a group of pathologically related syndromes resulting from myocardial ischemia. What does it actually mean? It is an imbalance between myocardial supply or perfusion and actually cardiac demand for oxygenating uh, blood with nutritional requirements. By the way, I emphasize, cardiac ischemia is generally well tolerated than hypoxia per se, such as may occur with severe anemia, cyanotic heart disease or advanced lung disease. Despite dramatic improvements in therapy in the past um, quarter century, ischemic heart disease in its various forms remains the leading cause of mortality um, in the United States and other developed nations, accounting for 7 million deaths worldwide each year. So. I believe I repeat the next point so many times so you can make a tattoo in your brain. In more than 90% of cases, ischemic heart disease is a consequence of reduced coronary blood flow secondary to obstructive atherosclerotic vascular disease. Thus, unless otherwise specified, ischemic heart disease usually is synonym with coronary artery disease, CAD. In most cases, the syndromes of ischemic heart disease are the late manifestation of coronary atherosclerosis that has been gradually building for decades, beginning even in childhood or adolescence. In other words, ischemic heart disease is one of the atherosclerosis form. Less frequently, but it's also possible, ischemic heart disease can result from increased demand, as you see on the slide, with increased, for example, heart rate or myocardial hypertrophy, also diminished blood volume, for example, hypotension or shock when numbers of the blood pressure uh, decreased uh, lower than uh, 60 and 40. Next uh, situation is the diminished oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. For example, uh, due to anemia or carbon monoxide poisoning. Also, diminished oxygenation, this one I omitted it. Here, example, classical example is chronic heart failure. Move on. Epidemiology. Nearly 
a half million Americans do, uh, die annually of ischemic heart disease. As troubling as this toll is, it represents a spectacular advance over previous eras. Since peaking, as you see, uh, uh, 1963, the mortality related to ischemic heart disease has declined by 50%. The improvement can be largely attributed by interventions that have diminished cardiac important risk factors. So, as you see, uh, what people actually have already done. So, um, we have some um, smoking cessation programs, um, improvements in hypertension and diabetes treatment, uh, and uh, use of um, uh, cholesterol-wearing agents, even if these drugs are not recommended for everyone today. So, to a lesser extent, diagnostic and uh, therapeutic advances have also contributed. This includes, so uh, this list, this include, um, for example, aspirin prophylaxis, better arrhythmia control, uh, what else it could be? Uh, coronary care units, uh, very important one, thrombolysis for myocardial infarction and uh, uh, some surgery, for example, like angioplasty, endovascular stenting, or this abbreviation um, is uh, uh, coronary artery bypass graft surgery. So, Maintaining this downward trend in mortality will be particularly challenging given the predicted uh, longevity of actually baby boomers as well uh, as epidemic of obesity that is sweeping the West world and not only here, unfortunately. So. Uh, as we stated, the manifestation of ischemic heart disease are a direct uh, consequence of the insufficient blood flow, blood supply uh, of the heart. So, I emphasize the clinical, this one, the clinical syndromes, the clinical presentation may include... Uh, uh, one or more of the following cardiac uh, syndromes. So, this is mainly for clinical diagnosis. So, first of all, uh, this is, as you see, um, angina pectoris. Literally, you can find term chest pain. So, ischemia induces uh, some pain, um, actually, to be honest, as more acute and severe ischemia, as more severe and burned the pain. So, but just ischemia is insufficient to cause myocyte uh, death. Again, only ischemia is insufficient to cause myocyte death. Move on. Angina uh, could be stable, so occurring predictably at certain levels of ex uh, exertion. Also can be by vessel spasm, prince metal angina, or can be unstable, uh, occurring with progressively less exertion or even at rest. We uh, will talk about all these uh, three uh, types a bit later. So, uh, the next point is the acute myocardial infarction, and there are uh, some its abbreviations, as you see, MI, AMI, 
the um, severity or duration of ischemia is sufficient to cause cardiomyositis. So only just presence of uh, ischemia actually means nothing. But severeness and uh, duration of this ischemia cause the cardiomyocyte death. In other words, cardiomyocyte necrosis could be caused only by specific ischemia type, severe acute one. Next one, chronic ischemic heart disease with chronic, this abbreviation, chronic heart failure, chronic ischemic heart disease. So, we have progressive cardiac decompensation after acute myocardial infection or secondary to chronic ischemia eventually precipitates mechanical pump failure. And the last one is the sudden cardiac death. This can occur as a consequence of tissue damage from myocardial infarction, but most commonly results from a lateral arrhythmia without myocyte necrosis. Mm, the term acute coronary syndrome is applied to any of three lateral manifestations of ischemic heart disease. Um, unstable angina pectoris, acute, acute uh, myocardial infarction, and uh, sudden uh, cardiac death. On the other hand, during the practical classes, seminars and CROC-1, you will be asked predominantly about morphological forms, so this classification or morphological classification of ischemic heart disease. So, there are uh, two basic forms, uh, acute one and uh, chronic one. And one acute one, uh, we can morphologically, so grossly and microscopically, prove only myocardial infarction, this one, after mostly six hours. Again, so uh, unstable angina and sudden cardiac death couldn't be for sure proved with morphological features. Move on. The chronic, chronic ischemic heart uh, disease, so chronic form, is uh, uh, actually just associates with sclerosis always. Again, chronic form is associates with sclerosis always because this is chronic, yes. Uh, it could be either focal, as you see here, focal cardiosclerosis or post-infarction, this post-infarction connective tissue growth. Another very common form is uh, diffuse cardiosclerosis. So, uh, we have a result of a chronic ischemia. Stable angina, as you see, actually is uh, the clinical name of diffuse cardiosclerosis. So I underline, I underline the significance of this classification. I mean, exactly morphological forms. Mostly uh, each student will be asked this question. So move on. Uh, let's recall some heart anatomy features. And um, on this picture, you could see the basic structure of heart supply. So uh, I'd like to ask you a question. 
How do you think? A thrombosis of which coronary artery would usually result in sudden death? The answer is the main left coronary artery. In comments, you can share your ideas why exactly this answer is right answer. Move on. Uh, let's discuss ischemic heart disease pathogenesis. So, the dominant cause of ischemic heart disease syndromes is an insufficient coronary perfusion related to the myocardial demand. We have already told this point. In the vast majority cases, this imbalance occurs as a consequence of the combination of pre-existing or so-called fixed atherosclerotic occlusion of coronary arteries on the one hand and on the other hand a new uh, superimposed thrombosis and or vasospasm. As you remember, we Usual, uh, we have studied with you during the first semester three main um, causes of the uh, infarction, generally, of any infarction. So these are thrombosis, embolism, and spasm. And here, in this uh, topic, we just uh, repeat uh, the truth. So, a uh, pre-existing or fixed plaque plus new superimposed thrombosis and or vasospasm. So, fixed obstruction leads obviously to the stenosis. And here is a very interesting point. Fixed obstructions that can occlude less than 75% of coronary, ar uh, coronary artery lumen typically are asymptomatic, even with exertion. So there is no clinical manifestation at all. In comparison, lesions that occlude more than 75% of uh, the vessel lumen cause symptoms predictably uh, cause chest pain and the patient is said to have stable angina. Move on. 90% uh, A fixed stenosis that occludes 90% or more of a vascular lumen can lead to inadequate coronary blood flow with symptoms even at rest. This is critical point, a uh, crucial point. Uh, because this stenosis is actually feature for unstable angina. And the uh, last important point about the collateral vessels. If an atherosclerotic lesion progressively occludes a coronary artery at a sufficiently slow rate over years, so take a lot of time. Remodeling of other coronary vessels may provide compensatory blood flow for the area at risk. Such collateral perfusion can subsequently protect against myocardial infarction, even if the vessel eventually becomes completely occluded. Remember, during the previous semester, we have uh, studied with you um, sh uh, shapes of the infarction. And uh, some, organs, uh, is, uh, uh, some organs are characterized by uh, wrong shape or infarctions without shape. And some organs have a triangle. Uh, shape infarction. 
So uh, when we have a wrong shape or uh, uh, not triangle shape infarction, it means that this organ has a um, huge uh, net of collateral vessels and heart is one of these organs. That's why shape of the myocardial infarction is always uh, um, not uh, right shape, so not triangle shape. But if we are talking about acute coronary blockage, so it happens at once, there is no time, obviously, for collateral flow. Uh, uh, so appear appearing of this development of this collateral flow and obviously uh, in this case infarction uh, will be move on the risk of an individual developing clinically important so with clinical manifestation ischemic heart disease so this risk depends in part on the number distribution, structure, and degree of obstruction of the arteriomatous plaque. However, the varied clinical manifestations of ischemic heart disease cannot be explained by just anatomic disease burden alone. Uh, this is partly partly for the so-called acute coronary syndromes namely as we said unstable angina acute myocardial infarction and sudden death these acute coronary syndromes are frequently initiated by an unpredictable and abrupt conversion of a stable atherosclerotic plaque to an unstable and potentially life-threatening atherothrombotic lesion through superfi um, uh, superficial erosion, ulceration, fissuring, rupture, or deep hemorrhage, usually with uh, superimposed thrombosis. So this is uh, classical um, classical definition, if I can say like this, from the main book about uh, pathology. So, factors. The initiating event typically is sudden disruption of partly occlusive plaque. So, the first one is always will be acute plaque change. So, plaques that contain a large atheromatose core or have seen overlying fibrose cap uh, are more likely to rupture and are therefore termed vulnerable or unstable. More than one mechanism of injury actually may be involved, as you see here. Yes, uh, so rupture, fissuring or ulceration of plaques can expose highly thrombogenic um, constituents or underlying subendothelial basement membrane leading to rapid thrombosis. Anyway, in addition, you also have possibility of um, hemorrhage development into the core of plaques um thereby acutely exhib sorry exacerbating yes exacerbating the degree of luminal occlusion so uh this picture very good to show everything that i said so here you can see so-called unstable plaque. You see so thin fibrose cap and really big, even huge atheromatose core here. So 
we have a rupture as you see and a completely obstructive thrombosis next one uh, next one uh, we need to say about inflammation uh, so uh, there is uh, a uh, list uh, of um, of the most important uh, substances so I do not repeat them to save our time you are really smart students so I'm sure you can read uh, next one uh, this slide again uh, recalls also familiar information about fates of the thrombus and um, I emphasize this part acute ischemia so this one uh, acute ischemia due to partial thrombosis with vasoconstriction so free lumen that thrombus does not block completely is closed completely by vasospasm again so that uh, free lumen of the vessel that thrombus does not block completely is closed absolutely utterly by vasospasm and uh, finally vasoconstriction so uh, there was the most interesting factor list and uh, i hope you can uh, read it um, on your own and we move on so and uh, right now um, I elaborate a bit information about each type of ischemic heart disease so first of all as you see obviously angina pectoris so um, angina pectoris is an intermittent chest pain caused by a reversible myocardial ischemia the pain probably is a consequence of the ischemia induced release of uh, adenosine bradykinin and uh, some other molecules that uh, stimulate the autonomic afferents and uh, as you see we have three main types so first one is uh, typical or stable angina so this is a predictable episodic chest pain associated with particular levels of exertion or some other increased demand for example tachycardia why not so the pain classically described as so this description uh, you will find in all clinical departments that you will study uh, further so description of the pain with angina pectoris so this is a crushing or squeezing substernal sensation that can radiate down to the left arm or to the left jaw so called referred pain so um, the pain usually is relieved by rest and this is important uh, or by uh, drugs such as um, such nitroglycerin, uh, some vasodilator that increase this coronary perfusion. So, pain uh, really is relieved by either rest or vasodilators and uh, or vasodilators, yes. Um, next is the uh, prince metal uh, angina so this type occurs important at rest and is caused by coronary artery spasm obviously here pain uh, uh, pain uh, relates with again 
uh, nitroglycerin and probably some uh, calcium channel blockers. So we need to uh, be free from the spasm. And last one is unstable angina, also called uh, crescendo angina. So this type is characterized by increasingly frequent pain that takes important more than 20 minutes. So as you see here classically 15 minutes. Everything that more than 20 minutes uh, usually is unstable angina and everything that more is more than 30 minutes, so half an hour, um, is considered as a myocardial infarction. So, um, unstable angina usually takes more than 20 minutes. Uh, um, and also, as a prince metal angina, this type can occur even at rest. Next one, myocardial infarction. So, um, you also can uh, see the term heart attack. So, myocardial infarction is necrosis. Remember this one. So, this is one of the type of uh, coagulative necrosis of heart muscle resulting obviously from ischemia. Uh, roughly... Um, um, 2 million people per year in the USA suffer a myocardial infarction. Of this, of this amount of people, one third die before they can get to the hospital. I underline it again. While myocardial infarction can occur at virtually any age, the frequency rises progressively with increasing age and with increasing atherosclerotic risk factors because myocardial infarction is a form of ischemic heart disease and ischemic heart disease is exactly one of the form of atherosclerosis. Nevertheless, approximately 10% of myocardial infarction occur before age 40 and 45% uh, uh, occur before age uh, 65. Uh, men are at significantly greater risk than women. Also, the gap progressively narrows with age. In general, women tend to be um, uh, remarkably protected against myocardial infarction only during their reproductive years. That's why menopause with declining estrogen production is associated with significant decreased, oh sorry, increased uh, risk of coronary artery disease um, and uh, ischemic heart disease uh, in this case uh, is the most common cause unfortunately of death in elderly women so myocardial response and now uh, several um, words i'd like to uh, uh, discuss with you uh, I'd like to discuss with you uh, response for the ischemia and some morphological changes that can probably or definitely prove myocardial infarction so loss of the myocardial blood uh, supply leads to profound functional biochemical and uh, morphological consequences i think it's clear within seconds of vascular obstruction so as you see here yes uh, 
we have uh, aerobic uh, glycolysis cases uh, leading to so we go in this uh, direction so uh, leading to um, to a drop in ATP and accumulation of potentially noxious metabolites um, within cardiomyocytes uh, the functional consequence is the rapid loss of contractility which occurs within a minute or so of the onset of ischemia so through several minutes heart can't beat uh, ultrastructural changes including uh, myo fibril relaxation uh, glycogen depletion cell and mitochondrial swelling also become rapidly apparent these early changes are potentially reversible so you see this one potentially reversible and uh, irreversible changes uh, so this one you can see the time so only severe ischemia lasting at least 20-40 minutes causes irreversible changes and myocyte death leading to coagulative necrosis um, Thus, if myocardial blood flow is restored before irreversible injury occurs, cells will be survive. Uh, actually, this is um, a cornerstone for earlier uh, diagnosis of myocardial infarction. Because if we can do thrombolysis or angioplasty before these irreversible changes, so we are absolutely, completely safe, not only life for this patient, but also quality of his life or she uh, or her life. So move on. Uh, before we continue with morphology, I have for you one tricky question. Um, how do you think, why does the necrosis spread from uh, endocardium to the, uh, as you see here, to the pericardium? The answer, the answer is because the subendocardium is the least well perfused by the subepicardial arteries. You see here arteries. So move on. Uh, and morphology. Finally, uh, morphology. The gross and microscopic appearance of a myocardial infarction depends on the age of the injury. So generally, generally, areas of damage progress through a highly characteristic sequence of morphologic changes from coagulative necrosis to acute and then chronic inflammation to fibrosis. But the cornerstone, please memorize this, the cornerstone is that in ischemia, no, no, no gross and microscopic findings are seen. Uh, visible changes, accessible changes are seen only with infarction. So you cannot see ischemia morphologically. Uh, that's why recognition of very recent myocardial infarction can be really challenging, particularly when death occurs within a few hours. So morphologically, we mostly can't say anything. So my, uh, what is the most important from this uh, table that I'd like to mention? So firstly, Myocardial infarcts less than 20 hours old usually are not grossly apparent. Next one. 
Myocardial infarctions more than three hours old can be visualized by, very interesting, exposing myocardium to vital stains. Right now we will see a picture about it. And finally, by 12 and 24 hours after myocardial infarction, an infarct usually can be grossly identified by a red-blue discoloration caused by stagnated and trapped blood. And uh, uh, everything after 10 days is related to the scar formation. Move on. This slide presented classification, or if I can say like this, dependence of myocardial infarction on the location and uh, nature of the diminished perfusion. Uh, on, the, on the left, so here, yes, uh, we have some patterns of transmural, as you see, infarction resulting from major coronary artery occlusion. Uh, also, you need to remember, right ventricle may be involved with occlusion of right main coronary artery as well. Uh, our right part, as you see, so uh, these patterns of infarction resulting from um, arterial or transient occlusion, global hypertension superimposed on fixed three vessel disease, or occlusion of a small intramyocardial vessels. So this three here small intramyocardial vessels you see how actually infarction does look like there is no big focus there is just small focuses but clinically this patient could have manifestation um, as he uh, has really huge focus of infarction. Um, move on. So, this is a gross spacement of an acute myocardial infarction of the postolateral, here, you see, uh, left uh, ventricle. And here, this color, where is my arrow? Here. So, this white color this is a lack of um, that specific stain um, because this is the area of necrosis so remind you uh, we can use this uh, vital stain uh, for three hour infarction to prove it um, the absence of the stain is uh, due to enzyme leakage after the cell death i think it's obvious um, I'd like you that you note the um, uh, oh, sorry uh, anterior where is it um, some anterior you see this one anterior scar so this patient had all uh, have already had uh, infarction so this patient has preceded infarction and uh, one more interesting point this one so uh, what is this this is the myocardial hemorrhage at the right edge of the infarction uh, and it happened uh, due to ventricular rupture rupture one of the most severe myocardial complication so called myomalation move on Microscopic feature of myocardial infarction and uh, its repair. And as you see here, one day. Uh, very interesting uh, feature, so-called waveness here, you see. So, uh, like wave. Yeah? And here to compare some normal cardiomyocytes. Um, also, note the distance. 
you see distance between these waves so this is edema move on uh, here we can see dense neutrophilic so you see how many neutrophils are there so these cells are all actually neutrophils so this is um, dense neutrophilic infiltration and you see time here yes and also the most important the most significant feature of necrosis is as you see here just shadows uh, of the nuclei and somewhere even absence of them so absence of the nuclei is 100 percent feature of necrosis move on so uh, this slide showed us a nearly complete removal of necrotic myocytes by phagocytic macrophages so these cells mostly uh, eat necrotic debris next one uh, through several weeks you see weeks organization uh, there is a granulation tissue that character uh, that is characterized by loose of connective tissue and uh, abundant capillaries so you see how many erythrocytes so these erythrocytes show us small capillaries and for now less amount of fibers so structures of the mature connective tissue move on finally scar formation uh, interesting point healed myocardial infarction consisting of a dense collagenous scar yes and here we can't divide uh, how old this infarction is so one month or 10 years this is just scar and uh, uh, last uh, one a slide about uh, ischemic heart disease this is a list of complications uh, anyway you need just memorize them uh, and uh, I think everything is clear so I do not need to uh, comment them only one point RV so right ventricle infarction um, what else probably chronic heart failure we also um, have already talked about it today so anyway this list you need to memorize um, also also i can add in this list a uh, very important uh, outcome is the uh, edema of the lung especially due to uh, acute left ventricle heart failure so again edema of the lung is classical um, outcome of the especially left ventricle heart acute left ventricle heart failure so and uh, uh, our second part hypertension so um, i hope you have already known that hypertension is another major health problem all around the world um, also it occasionally manifests in acute aggressive form high blood pressure is much more often unfortunately asymptomatic for many many years and then just once at once leads to severe catastrophe but uh, this uh, condition sometimes referred to uh, as benign hypertension because of the asymptomatic uh, behavior but you shouldn't think that uh, this uh, benign hypertension is harmless mm -mm. absolutely uh, absolutely uh, not right uh, hypertension is harm um 
on each its stage. So, uh, increasing the risk of uh, stroke hemorrhage in the brain tissue, I hope you know this one, and atherosclerotic coronary heart disease, hypertension can lead to the cardiac hypertrophy and heart failure uh, that we know as hypertensive heart uh, disease. Also, also, hypertension lead, uh, could lead to the aortic dissection, um, multi-infarction dementia, and even renal failure. Um, one more point that I like to share with you. Uh, we have some accepted wisdom, if I can say like this. So this wisdom is that uh, such essential hypertension uh, results from the interplay of genetic polymorphisms and uh, environmental factors. So this is always a combination. Move on. Uh, a few words about uh, blood pressure regulates. So um, as you see, uh, we have uh, uh, blood pressure that uh, uh, depends on cardiac output and the peripheral resistance and uh, a list of uh, different factors that influence on this uh, on each of this part and due to this we have uh, changing changes in the blood pressure um, what is uh, uh, the most important um, substance obviously this is uh, renin and uh, angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2. So this uh, system. Uh, I'd uh, like to say a few uh, words about them. So uh, in the kidney, exactly in the juxtaglomeral apparatus, some renin could be um, synthesized. And uh, uh, when it happens, when the blood uh, pressure is lower, the lower that kidney sink is normal situation. Uh, next one, uh, angiotensinogen uh, converts to the angiotensin, and uh, then angiotensin uh, angiotensin one converted to angiotensin 2 and exactly angiotensin 2 is the main uh, factor uh, that we have uh, to regulate of the blood pressure. Move on. Definition. Uh, definition of the uh, hypertension. So, we have uh, more than uh, 140 systolic pressure and more than 90 diastolic pressure. Hypertension uh, mostly is essential, so we do not know the cause. And only 5% of uh, patients could be treated. And that's why you need to fight for this 5%. Because this 5% you can uh, treat not like symptomatically, but etiologically. So you can treat them completely if you really find the cause. So that's why you need to know what do you need to look, in, uh, to look for. So this table you need to memorize as a complications of myocardial infarction. Unfortunately, there is no exception. Obviously, the most common is renal secondary hypertension. Uh, the second place is endocrine uh, 
type. Move on. Uh, about uh, some um, mechanisms, actually, uh, I'd like to uh, to discuss with you some of them. So first one, uh, as you see, uh, this is reduced renal sodium. This is a key factor for sure, um, because um, reduced renal sodium um, excretion in the presence of normal arterial pressure probably uh, I can say that this is a corner uh, stone yes I can say like this so um, uh, what what is going on uh, decreased sodium excretion causes an obligatory increase in fluid volume and increased cardiac output, thereby elevating blood pressure. At the new higher blood pressure, the kidneys excre uh, excrete abdominal so uh, sorry, additional uh, sodium. Thus, uh, a new steady state of sodium excretion is achieved but at the expense of elevated blood pressure. Next one is increased vascular resistance. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's clear usually this is due to either vasoconstriction, this is not stable situation, uh, more interesting and unfortunately uh, more severe situation when we have structural changes in the vessel walls. Um, next point, there are mm, not necessarily independent factors as chronic vasoconstriction may result in permanent sickening of the wall of affected vessels. So what does it mean? If right now this is not a uh, state meant so this is not a state uh, stable situation with time if we do not do uh, anything with this vasoconstriction this vasoconstriction uh, leads to the sclerosis in the wall and that's why we will have um, this uh, decreased lumen for whole life rest life and next two i think uh it's easy to get into so these are genetic factors um obviously uh and uh, uh, some um, environmental factors as stress obesity smoking physical inactivity um, and so on oh sorry uh so morphology the most interesting part so in this case we have um, two forms of small blood vessel disease so um, these are hyaline atherosclerosis and the hyperplastic athero uh, uh, sorry uh, hyaline arteriolosclerosis it's important arteriolosclerosis and the hyperplastic arteriolosclerosis uh, so here uh, this is the uh, um, accumulation of homogeneous pink pinkish pink unstructured uh, hyaline or masses uh, in the um, wall of the arterioli and due to this accumulation we see the uh, narrowing of the lumen of the uh, vessel. So, uh, usually hyaline accumulation, this is for benign hypertension and hyperplastic changes is for malignant hypertension. So, this is classical appearance, so-called onion ski, uh, skin, so changes in the vessels uh, that is more typical of uh, severe hypertension. 
Um, so what do you see here? So you see concentric laminated thickening of arterial walls and luminal obviously narrowing. Uh, these laminations consist of small muscle cells and thickened, um, even uh, reduplicated basement membrane. Um, also, also, uh, you can see here uh, malignant uh, hypertension or uh, um, malignant hypertension. Actually, um, a hypertensive crisis is also could happen, uh, could, um, could show this appearance. Uh, we are talking about this picture and this is fibrinoid necrosis. Um, especially in uh, in kidney. So uh, next uh, important point: this is a classification according to the changes in the organs and tissue. So stage one: we do not have any changes in the organ and tissue. Uh, so mostly there is no clinical manifestation as well. Uh, and compare please with stage three when we have actually uh, severe uh, clinical uh, symptoms, severe clinical manifestations, and we can name these manifestations as catastrophes. So uh, changes in the organs uh, in the heart classically. This is the hypertrophy of the left ventricle we see the uh, sorry uh, we see the increased thickness of the wall of the left ventricle next one hypertensive retinopathy so uh, so-called cotton uh, wools um, these um, cotton wool spots uh, please memorize this one because you can use this like a keyword uh, in your croc one and be sure that uh, your mcq is about hypertension third stage uh, next point so we have three main stages of hypertrophy so the first one this one when we have narrow lumen of the left ventricle this is compensation and the last one when we have increased significantly lumen of the left ventricle, this is decompensation. And last, uh, in the middle, uh, you can see so-called subcompensation. So when we have uh, the process of increasing the lumen, but this one is concentric hypertrophy, this one is X centric hypertrophy move on hemorrhage so classical uh, complication of uh, hypertension is rupture of the wall of the vessel uh, and uh, uh, formation of hematoma um, as you see this is a cyst after the hemorrhage and you see the color of the wall of this cyst. The color of the wall is brownish. So this is the hemosiderosis. Remember, uh, focal hemosiderosis uh, and brownish uh, wall of the cyst uh, gives us information that it was um, hemorrhage, not, um, not ischemic infarction. So, and right now, a few words before, um, about uh, comparison between atherosclerosis and uh, um, hypertension. So, atherosclerosis is uh, something, as you see, without blood. There is mostly no erythrocytes. So, ischemic stroke. Uh, this is... Uh, um, chronic changes in the uh, brain due to the chronic ischemia and compare with uh, uh, hypertension so here is 
hemorrhage, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, even diffuse perivascular hemorrhage due to the hypertensive crisis. So, if you see in your PROC 1 questions or conditions that describe a lot of blood anywhere uh, in the brain, um, some focuses of hemorrhages, so for sure this is about uh, complications of the hypertension. Uh, and uh, some features about kidney. So classically, primary shrunken kidney is for hypertension. But with time, if we are talking about complete renal artery stenosis, remember this, that critical stenosis, yes? Uh, in the kidney, we also will have atrophy. So a lot of... Uh, connective tissue fibrosis and decreased amount of parenchyma. So these kidneys mostly look uh, the same or probably familiar, but the processes are, uh, the causes are different. And this one also shrunken kidney, but this kidney is due to atherosclerosis. Uh, where is the difference between these two? This is due to hypertension. This is due to uh, atherosclerosis. What is the difference? The, the difference is the uh, type of the surface. Here is a small granular surface. Here is the, so big hills and some like absence of tissue. Exchanging, uh, so some focuses with absence of tissue and some focuses with heels. This absence of tissue is a scar after the infarction of the kidney due to atherosclerosis. And these, uh, these heels are uh, survived hypertrophic uh, parenchyma of the kidney. Uh, that's it for today. I hope my lecture was uh, useful for you. Uh, it makes uh, your prepare for uh, your preparation before the class easier. And uh, um, I hope I made some important point um, in your brain about today's topic. And um, you will be great uh, during the practical class, seminars, and even CROC 1. So have a nice day. Um, see you next time. Goodbye.